Good evening. Welcome to uh, Policy Feats and Pipe, Arctic Condition. I am Robert Cole, Director of Operations for the Manitoba Institute of Policy Research, based in the Department of Political Studies at the University of Manitoba. The Institute is a hub for academic analysis, public policy discourse, and outreach. Our goal is to bring together government, practitioners, scholars, and members of the community with the intent of further debates and discussion on public policy issues that affect all Manitobans. Policy Beats and Pint is an outreach series produced by MIPR and the Western Free Press Cafe. We hope the series will provide you with what is an insightful and thought provoking discussion on the Zenith's policy topic and future policy topics to come. Before I introduce tonight's speaker, I would like to thank the Governor of Manitoba, the University of Manitoba, the Faculty of Arts and the Department of Public Studies at the University of Manitoba for their ongoing support. Uh, thank you also to Dan Lett, who will be moderating the discussion after Dr. Schoen's presentation. We will be recording tonight's presentation, and it will be available on the MIPR website in the near future. We will not be recording the question and answers portion. And last of all, most importantly, to thank you all for coming out tonight and taking part in this. So, Dr. Schoen holds a PhD from, I didn't know his name correctly, so that's my fault. Um, it's a French pronunciation, right? Dr. Schoen? <laughs> not, not even close, right? Uh, holds a PhD from the Royal Military College of Canada, Department of War Studies. She obtained a Master's in International Relations from Webster University Life in the Netherlands, a Master's of Public Administration from Dalhousie University, and a Bachelor of Science Honors from Queen's University. Dr. Trump worked for various federal departments, including the Privy Council Office and the Security and Intelligence Secretariat. She completed her postdoctorate at Charlton's Norman Patterson School of International Affairs and is now assistant professor and deputy director for the Center for Defense and Security Studies at the University of Manitoba. Dr. Sharon has written extensively on the Army and the Security Council. Welcome and thank you. Number five is that northerners are 
are opposed to all resource extraction projects of all kinds. In fact, they would like them all to stay out and make it one giant park. The sixth myth is that Canada's Arctic is a large contributor to Canada's GDP. The seventh is that Canada's lead Arctic agency is the Department of Defense and the Canadian Armed Forces. And the more of them we have, the better. And the more equipment we have in the north, the better. The eighth is that Canada's Arctic is under threat and, and picked your poison. There's the Russians, the US, Al-Qaeda, you name it, they're after us. Number nine is that Canadian, the Canadian government vessels can't operate all year long. In fact, with, like, with uh, climate change, the Arctic will be open all year round for everybody. Um, and apparently the six months of darkness, that just goes away as well. <laughs> and, and, and the temperature, I, seriously. And number 10, that climate change is a driver of economic opportunity. So what we're going to do is go through these top 10 myths, and I'm going to present a different picture to you, literally. I'm doing this mostly by pictures. So here we go. Myth number one, our Arctic is just the three territories. While that's patently false, our Arctic includes the three territories. It also includes the waters, of course. It's the Arctic Ocean. But it also includes northern Quebec and Labrador. We have a large Inuit population in all of these parts. And the myth is that actually there are more southerners in the Arctic than there are Inuit and Aboriginals. Well, that's not true either. It may be true as you move out west, but certainly in the Eastern Arctic, the population is Aboriginal. And we have three Aboriginal groups that are mostly represented in the Arctic. We have the Inuit, Wichin, and Dene. The next myth is that the true north is strong and free. Here is the price of grapes from the North Mart in Iqaluit. It's over $9. Here's the price for milk. It's $7.75 for two liters. And this is highly subsidized, I might add. So how on earth you survive with those prices, I'm not sure. Any guesses for toilet paper? Average price for toilet paper, 24 rolls. 24 rolls, 25 bucks. $50. Oh my god. <laughs> and there's a reason for that, because all of the resources that come into the Arctic come by two routes, the sea or by air. Now there are a few roads in White Horse, on places like that, but for the most part, when we're talking about the majority of our Arctic territory, there's only two routes to get things in and out, and the tree line Although we have a tree line in our western Arctic, it falls off quickly, and we don't have any trees in the eastern Arctic. So it's not even a case of cutting down trees and processing paper and uh, products and the like. This is a picture of the superstore in White Horse when the roads were closed for a while. Food insecurity becomes a big problem. And to craft dinner. I don't know if you've noticed, but on craft dinner now, they have a best before date. Now this is an expiry date, it's a best before date, so it means it's at its best if consumed within by the date. But now because of that best before date, you cannot ship craft dinner into the Arctic by sea, it has to come in by air. And that automatically increases the price of what is a staple, not just for Southern Canadians, but also in the Arctic. They do like KD. It is one of the, the choices of food that is more within their income range. But because of that fact that it has to be flown, it increases the price considerably. Here is a snapshot of the Arctic. And this is where I would like to say that the Arctic is, in fact, strong. You have a population that is much much younger than the rest of Canada. And they are extremely bright and extremely entrepreneurial. 
and given the right opportunities and the chances, they can do some amazing things. However, here are some of the statistics that work against them. This is just one, the infant mortality rate for the Arctic, and I don't have a highlighter here, but if you see over here, here is the Northwest Territories and Nunavut and the Yukon, their infant mortality rates are much higher than for the rest of Canada. So the idea that, can, that the Arctic is the true North strong and free, maybe we need to think about that. Next, the myth three is that there is a lack of international laws or rules or norms governing the Arctic. Here is just a snapshot of some of them. We have security related organizations, we have many, NORAD, NATO, marginally, the International Maritime Organization and others. We have rules and norm related organizations and rules, the Arctic Council, the Inuit Circumpolar Council, many of the indigenous groups. We have legal institutions like the UN Convention on the Law of the Sea, a very important body of law that governs 70% of the world, and when we're talking about the Arctic and its notion, it plays a large role. We also have Canadian laws and local, provincial, territorial, and Inuit rules and norms. All of these mean that the Arctic is not lacking in rules and institutions. What we're missing is the coordination of these rules and laws, who is responsible for enforcing them, and do they still make sense, especially if the majority of them come from the southern Canada. Myth number four, our sovereignty is under peril because we have all sorts of arguments and disputes with other organizations and states. Well, in fact, according to the Department of Foreign Affairs, we have just three. One is with Denmark vis-a-vis -vis Hans Island, which is found between the eastern coast of Canada and Greenland. It's 1.3 square kilometers of rock in the middle of Davis Strait. It's been all but solved. We're just waiting to cross the I's and the T's. It's going to be split right up the middle. Nobody lives there. There are no permanent installations. It will simply be another line on the map. Number two, again with Denmark. I, I didn't realize the Danish were uh, so troublesome. But with Danish, with Denmark, it's the maritime boundary in the Lincoln Sea. We quibbled a little bit about where exactly the maritime boundary is. That's been solved. Number three is with the U.S. And it's in the Beaufort Sea. And again, it's a maritime boundary. But this is well managed. Many, many lawyers are working on this on a fairly regular basis. Note, the status of the Northwest Passage is not a sovereignty dispute. There is no question that it is Canadian. There is no question about the boundaries. The issue is the amount of control Canada can exert in terms of rule making with respect to foreign ships. That's the issue, but that's not a sovereignty issue. Here's an example of the Beaufort Sea. What we see is that slight, <laughs> and the slight disagreement on the boundaries. Ironically, if Canada accepted the U.S. position, we'd be better off, but if the U.S. accepted the Canadian position, we'd be better off. So all estimations are that this will get solved in the fullness of time. Myth number five is that Aboriginals and Northerners in the Arctic do not want to see any sort of resource extraction. Well, this is patently false. And in fact, the Inuit Circumpolar Council has issued a number of very, very well declarations on what it means to be sovereign and on responsible development, resource development. And here is just a snippet of those declarations. What they want, and what the Canadian government now has asked for, is responsible development. How you measure responsible, I'm, I'm not quite sure. But that is the goal of many of the Northerners. Myth number
number six. There are many numbers there, and I'll break it down for you. Myth number six is that the Arctic is a large contribution to Canada's overall GDP. Well, let's just look at these numbers. If you look overall at the amount of money that the Arctic creates, we're talking, I'll show you back here, we're talking about $230 million total. Russia's wedge is by far the biggest. Russia pulls in 67% of Arctic GDP contributions. Canada's wedge is really quite small. It's only 1.9%. But we need to put this into the Canadian perspective. When we look at the Canadian perspective, our Arctic accounts for 0.51% of our GDP, even though it represents 41% of our land mass. So we need to think about that. It's not that there are not resources, it's that we have to consider the amount of money and resources and energy that's needed to get the supplies into the Arctic and then take the raw resources out of the Arctic so that it can be refined elsewhere. So the actual raw number in terms of what our Arctic is producing is still relatively small. The next myth is that the Department of Defense and specifically the Canadian Armed Forces is the lead agency in the Arctic. Well, that's not true at all. In fact, most of the rules and laws that pertain to the Arctic cannot be enforced by the Canadian Armed Forces. They're not in a constabulary role. They're in the role of defending against military threats, not checking to make sure people are, are, are adhering to the Arctic Water Pollution Prevention Act and things like that. So this is just a snippet of some of the Canadian agencies and departments that are in the Arctic, and I haven't even listed all of them. For instance, we have Justice Canada that's there, the RCMP, Fisheries and Oceans, which is of course our Coast Guard, and they work as a whole of government. You cannot survive in the Arctic, literally or figuratively, without getting help from other people. And we see this even in the military exercises that the Canadian Armed Forces do, do run in the Arctic. They involve Transport Canada and the Coast Guard and Environment Canada and a whole host of government agencies, including Parks. Parks Canada is actually an extremely important Canadian Arctic player. A, it has the most federal crown land north of 60, and they're responsible for search and rescue on their territory. They only call in the RCMP and the Canadian Forces when things go really, really wrong. Myth number eight, and this is that we need more of the Canadian Armed Forces and D&D &D in our Arctic. Well, this is taken from a document from D&D, the 17th of May, 2013. The working assumption of not only the Canadian Armed Forces, but the U.S. Armed Forces, the Danish Armed Forces, the Norwegian Armed Forces, many of our Arctic states, is that there is no immediate military threat. We have a whole host of problems in the Arctic, but they're not of a military nature. They're of a criminal, constabulary, rule of law, lack of housing, lack of services, all of which are not within the purview of the Canadian Armed Forces to fix with more Arctic Patrol vessels. The other uh, point is that it's really other government departments that have the lead in the Arctic. And the Department of Defense and Canadian Armed Forces is there to support them and there to aid the civil powers. So just like when we have flood situations in Manitoba and we need the Canadian Armed Forces, it's the same type of thing for them in the Arctic. They're there for search and rescue, mostly by air and by land and general aid to the civil powers. Myth number nine. Our Canadian 
government vessels can operate in the Arctic all year round. Uh, that's not true. That's not quite true. It's, Sheba. Pardon me? Sheba. Yeah, but it, when we're talking about like the Arctic Patrol vessels and the Navy vessels and things like that, they have limited operating capacity for the three months of the year in the summer when the Arctic truly does open up. But that's okay, because really there hasn't been a need for it. In 2012, despite the fact that many people are saying that the Northwest Passage is opening up and we're seeing more transits, we had only 31 transits for the whole summer. What we are seeing is more destinational shipping, which means you pop into the Northwest Passage and you pop out again. You don't actually transit it. But we have to ask ourselves whether or not we need the capability to have vessels up there all year round. It is dangerous, dangerous work up there. We don't have the charts. The Northwest Passage still hasn't been fully charted. When you look at a chart that the, the, the military have used on several of their exercises, there are great big holes where there are missing soundings. They have no idea what is actually there. And on the charts, there are actually dotted lines around suspected navigational hazards. That doesn't happen in anywhere else in the world. And finally, myth number 10. And this is that with climate change, we are going to see a rush of businesses coming up to the Arctic, and they're all going to be of sound mind and investment. Well, here is a picture of an RV park in Cape Dorset. <laughs> there is not one single RV on Cape Dorset. You couldn't even get an RV there if you wanted to, because things can only come in by or by plane. But they actually, it was somebody in the South that decided this would be a good business opportunity. You can have where you can plug in the RV. <laughs> Problem is, very difficult to keep the permafrost level enough to actually put an RV there. But the kicker is this beautiful uh, kids' play structure <laughs> that goes basically unused. Because to get to it, it's quite a hike. And when you're in the Arctic, you don't just send the kids, you know, up over the mountains to go find play structures because it's a dangerous place. A, because of the weather, because of the darkness, wild animals, etc., etc. So this is not an example of Southerners suggesting what the North needs, and it was, it's, it sits there to this day. Next is the Iqaluit swimming pool which is very, very well used. It's only four lanes, but it is a very, very busy place. But it needs repairs, and the bill right now stands at about $180,000, which I think is actually, considering how expensive pools are here to fix, it's a pretty modest price. Here's the artist's rendition of what they would like to have for a new pool which will run about $40 million. Now the take home message is not how dare they, you know, think about a $40 million swimming pool. I'm amazed by two things. One, that it would only be $40 million for a new pool, considering that everything down to the last flutter board has to be brought in probably by plane. So consider that expense. But B, considering how well used it is in Iqaluit, is this the right option? It's going to mean that there may not be a pool until this one either gets fixed or this one is built. But it's something that we as Southerners don't really have the right to judge until we actually go there and see how expensive it is to run things up there and how important some of these investments are to the Northerners. But here's the Manitoba connection. The only port in our Arctic is in Churchill. We are actually bordering the Arctic Ocean, which I think most Manitobans forget. And here is a real opportunity. But we have a problem. We only have a rail line to Manitoba. It needs repairing. Usually 
about a mile offshore because the tides are over eight meters. You have to then unload everything onto a barge, beach the barge, and then use front end loaders to, to unload everything. It is really, really difficult and dangerous work. And that's reality I'm not sure a lot of Canadians realize. So there we go. Those are our top 10 myths questioned. And so um, I, I look forward to your questions. And I'd just like to draw your attention to uh, a couple of things that you should watch out for in terms of what Canada is going to be doing in the Arctic. One is our submission to the Commission on the Limits of the Continental Shelf, which will be due December 2013. Next is, and I think one of the best sources of information, but much underused, is the UN Arctic Human Development Report, which provides a snapshot of not only Canada, but all of the Arctic. And finally, I want to invite you to a conference that uh, the Political Studies Students Conference in January, free to the public, and it's going to be exploring all things Arctic, the culture, security, the people, and all that sort of thing. So I'd like to invite you all now to the University of Manitoba. So thank you, I look forward to your questions.